What's going on, everybody? Welcome to our downtown studios. This is Five Rounds Today. I'm John Ramdeen. He's Robin Black. And, of course, we're going to be looking ahead to all the action going down in New York, as well as uh, the week prior, Mexico City will host UFC Fight Night, um, an amazing main event. Uh, Rafael Dos Anjos, the former lightweight champion, taking on Tony Ferguson. You got Diego Sanchez versus the uh, former Bellator standout, Marcin That's Held. before? That's before. Oh, yeah. 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 November, November 5th, yeah. Uh, November 5th, yeah. Uh, also, we'll be Mexico. doing TKO in Montreal. And we got TKO. Weekend. Also, uh, yeah. we were talking about Mike Perry, um, Sam Alvey on this card Ooh. as well. Uh, and I, again, we're going to get to all the stuff in New York, but we have to look back, right? Yeah. You and I haven't had a chance mm-hmm. to really mm-hmm. talk about what happened at UFC 204. Um, Canadian Thanksgiving. Yeah, 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 yeah that's right. That's it. Uh, so we had the Monday off. Um, I said Mike Perry. Mike Perry, of course, on, on that card. He keeps fighting like that. He's going to get himself knocked <laughs> out. Sure but, he is. Before, before uh, we talk about Mike Perry or all the undercard action, main event, Michael Bisping, Dan Henderson. Um, what's interesting, because I've seen a lot of tweets from pro fighters, fighters in the UFC, saying that they got it wrong, that the, the judges mm-hmm. should have given the fight to Dan Henderson. I just don't think they're being objective. Yeah. I think that they're, they're biased because Dan Henderson's a legend. We all love Dan Henderson. Yeah. We love what he's done for the sport. We love the fact that he's always been in big fights. Uh, he's the man. I just did a... Um, with the help of Chase and Bobby T and Glennie Mack and um, George Huffman and Warman, we put together this three-hour special on awesome. Dan Henderson. So you go, you get to look back at his career. He's just been in big fights his entire mm-hmm. career. You know, from the start of his mixed martial arts career, a tournament in Brazil, <laughs> then a, a UFC tournament, and then a rings tournament, and then joining Pride and yeah. fighting for the UFC and strike for just countless titles. So I think when, when the pros look at this guy, they're just so extremely biased. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and the feel-good uh, nature. Yeah, what, yeah, yeah. What, what, would, like, what do we mean? I mean, I think a lot of slash many slash maybe most people thought if Dan had won rounds one and two, we're going into yeah. five. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. With the legend being able to go, all he's got to do is land that thing a couple yeah. more times, and like that feel, that feeling was so exciting yeah. that that'll color you and, too. And, and that's it. And and I think though, when you when you remove the bias, when you look at uh, the way the scoring criteria works, the ten nine must system, uh, the UFC utilizes, you have to be ad- objective. And when I. And I was being objective, and I had and you been, love you were I, love, I was Henderson. hoping to God that Dan Henderson would win win the title, but afterwards, after the five rounds, it seemed very clear to me that Michael Bisping had won the majority of those rounds. Certainly, won three of the rounds for me, and I think the judge just got it right. However, I, I also think that a lot of fighters um, have a mentality of well. That's not the way the scoring should be. Yeah, right. We it should be closer to the pride scoring, where the attempt to finish the fight means the most. Somebody looking at the attempt to finish the fight by knockout or submission, mm-hmm. damage, and because of those things, like well, look at that guy's face, and then look at that guy's face. Who would you rather be? Yeah. Who leaving the cage? Would you rather be Michael Bisping or Dan Henderson? And from your perspective as a martial yeah. artist, and again, if if there was no specific scoring. Throw the scoring out the window. Who did you have winning the fight? Ooh, that's that's interesting. I, I rarely think of it from that way. And, and I remember when George fought Hendricks. Yeah. And then they were talking about, well, if this and if that. And for us, it's like, if it was scored different, we would fight different. Yeah. We would train different. Yeah. We would game plan different. The fight would be different. And of course, uh, for us, was right. George would have fought. It's a 25 minute yeah, fight. Yeah. It's different. And same with this. But let's just say the scoring was the way it was until that day. And they said, oh, surprise. Yeah, we're going to yeah, change yeah. it. That's a good question. I mean, ultimately, Dan Henderson landed. What I'm going to say is for sure six enormous right hands. <laughs> you know what I mean? The one in round one that like yeah. almost disintegrated yeah. Bisping. Yeah. And the one in round two that, do you remember like the impact? Oh, and yeah. how He dropped very similar <laughs> to how Rockhold dropped yeah, yeah. when he caught him with that left hook. So, but it's 25 minutes. Yeah, you know, know what I mean? That's a, that's a very hard question. Mike had a great fight. Oh, man. It, and they both did. And, um, uh, you know, if, if if we agree that Henderson lost that fight, and not everyone will agree with us, 
But a big important thing is those fighters need to convince those three dudes. Mm -hmm. Those three dudes or ladies, yeah. they could be idiots. Yeah, but right. they're the ones you need to convince. You don't need to co convince Twitter. Yeah. You don't need to convince that's the underground. True. You don't need to convince me or any of these yeah. fighters. You need to convince those guys. And that's what they did. Uh, but if we do say that we agree that Mike won round five, and I was very surprised that people were, oh, Dan won round five. It's, go back and watch round five. It's a hard. That's a hard argument to make, yeah. um, except for the fact that man, you just want to see him do it. Yeah, like yeah, I get yeah, that. Yeah. But so then we go back to round one, and now we we look back, and in retrospect, we go, you know, people don't give enough ten eight rounds. That's maybe how the scoring should be more. If we're going to be scoring more the way it should be. And round two is a 10 10. 10. 10. Yep. You know what I mean? Yeah, so all enough. of a sudden, Mike still won it. And people, what do you mean? He, he, he knocked uh, Bisping down. Yeah, Bisping can Mike. basically control that whole, the major, the bulk of that round was sco was controlled by Michael Bisping just landing almost at the will. The four minutes of that round was Mike's best yeah. minutes of yeah. the fight. Yeah, I, I loved the fight. I mean, it was a gift of a fight to have. And, and for Henderson to go out like that and, ah, damn it, I think I had it all. I was, I mean, he won or lost on the game plan he went in with. And it really made a lot of sense. Uh, plan A, knock that guy out with that right hand. <laughs> yeah, that's, right? That, that's always that's plan That's the first a. assignment. Yeah. yeah, that's assignment A. That is, our, yeah. that is one of the ways we're gonna win it. Damn, we almost did a couple times. Plan B is if we're going to express that the way we're going to express it, so that if we get to a round five, we have enough energy to go for it. And that so, but because of that, he lost round three, round four, and ultimately round five, and those other minutes of round two because he didn't work that. He wasn't going to do a ton of work. Now, is 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 there anything he could have done if his team? You bring in the best nutritionists and best mm -hmm. trainers. I mean, the guy's forty six. That's it. So you're only, he's only going to get to where he can get to. You, you nailed it, and that there are physical and biological limitations oh. to what he was capable of. And he worked around those in such a way that his expression of energy was gonna be the maximum amount he could express to still maintain the ability to yeah. knock you out at any time and still be in the fight late in the fight. And that's what he did. And he did it to perfection. And if he landed one more punch in the fifth round or landed the different one in the second round, he wins the fight. But, he, but Mike, we're gonna give Dan Henderson credit forever. Mike Bisping, one, when, when you and Cody were just talking about round one uh, and how it didn't feel like he was almost done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's poker face. That's yeah. the Bisping poker face. That's the Mike Bisping swagger. That's that's the soccer hooligan ass in him. And I think you the know reason what I mean? that when we're having the conversation, when, when you're talking about 10-8 rounds, and I, I love it, is if we start introducing 10-8 rounds, we also have to make sure that people are given 10-10 rounds. Mm -hmm. so and round two was just, that. So, no doubt exactly. So when, when we're looking at that, when I, right now, I see a 10-8 round as somebody that's close to getting finished. Yeah. You see somebody lock in a submission. Damian Maya has a triangle yeah. choke, and it's like five seconds before yeah. the end of the fight, and he has it locked in. I give that a 10 And he's been dominating. And he's you. been dominating. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, and with this, even though Henderson knocked Bisping down, I didn't feel that Bisping was on the verge of being stopped because of ex his experience. Maybe mm -hmm. it's because I've seen what Bisping's mm -hmm. capable of. Uh, he didn't, he wasn't stationary. Mm -hmm. He was constantly mm -hmm. moving. He seemed so aware to me that, you know what's gonna happen in a fight? You're gonna get punched and you're gonna fall down in a fight. <laughs> yeah. This is just, now it's your responsibility to respond. Bisping did respond, he ended up winning the fight. Yeah. So that's why I would not give that yeah. necessarily a 10-8 round. And again, if you do give it a 10-8 round, Henderson wins, right? Had, it's a draw. Oh, it's a draw, if right, And right. a 10-9 in round two, yeah, then yeah. you got the old guy on a yeah. draw. Now is he going to retire? Yeah. Is he yeah, going for right. one more time? That would be the worst case scenario for Hendo's wife. <laughs> you know what I mean? The worst case scenario <laughs> for us. Awesome. She's like, oh, God, man. Like, you, you know? <laughs> like, she would just. Oh, God. Uh, as it is, the best case scenario, this is the very close second best case scenario. Really the best fight you could bring at 46 years old with the limitations that you have. And the limitations are, become physical. That was as much as he could go. There was nothing left. He pushed it with everything yeah. he had, you know? And that's why it was so beautiful. Uh, Bisbee will not get much credit uh, in this, as much credit as he deserves oh, in this God. fight. Yeah. Which is uh, sad. And, I mean, I guess he's never gonna now. He has the most wins in UFC history. 
He has landed the most significant strikes in fights in the history of the UFC, and he's just a close second for the most minutes ever in a cage in the UFC, and he's the UFC middleweight champion, and he's still not going to get respect. So, Mike, just... Just accept it. That but the they're, thing is, that who, they're like that. The, the reality is, though, you know, whether it's these casual fans that tune in to to, to see Michael Bisping, say, oh, I just hate that guy. <laughs> yeah. I think most martial arts enthusiasts, fighters, trainers recognize that you're seeing greatness in Michael Bisping. They do. I, I believe they do. Um, when we were in Montreal, we were uh, talking to Faras and, and lots of his people. And he wanted and, to work with them. Yeah, and I'd been speaking with yeah. Mike because he was in Toronto training with our guy, George uh, Blanco, mm-hmm. Jorge. Mm-hmm. And uh, and he'd been training here, and he was talking about going to Montreal. And he said to me, oh, I've, I've always wanted to go train at TriStar. And Faras was thrilled. Yeah, yeah. He'd always wanted to work with them. They understand of what course. this guy is. But you're right. He's made tons of money. Yeah. He's very, very mouthy and good on the mic, which lots of people enjoy, but irritate people. Somebody, what was it somebody said the other day? He talks like Conor McGregor, but fights like George St. Pierre. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <It's> awesome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Personally, it's a full package. Uh, yeah, he's got everything, and he's very, very good on television. Yeah, All of yeah. that kind of stuff. If you're another fighter, and he ever kind of gets under your skin, which is one of his skills, uh, you're just looking at him. Oh, why is his life so good? But then you don't understand what he's put himself through, yeah. what he's done to his body. Yeah, his, yeah. He's done it at more. He spent more minutes in there than almost anybody. He's fought incredibly tough fights. He's landed more strikes and yeah. absorbed more strikes. So you don't look and go, oh well, you know, why don't I get these opportunities? Like some of us, sometimes. In life, we do that. We, we shouldn't do that, but we mistakenly think some people have got something that we haven't, some opportunities or chances. Michael Bisping has earned every single 100%. thing that he has. And he's probably had more challenges in some ways because people are out, out to get him, they're out to stop him, they're out to prove him wrong. You know, t- Weidman's one of our favorites, just like Mike is. Weidman wants to kill this guy. <laughs> yeah, you know that's what I mean? Awesome. He's going through the, the world. Hell out yeah, of these yeah, he's going through the world making enemies too. It's hard to do. That's a hard way to, to do it, and he's doing it. Uh, We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the co-featured bout, which also impacts the 185-pound rankings. Welcome back to Five Rounds Today. Ram Dean and Black with you chatting about UFC 204 that went down in Manchester, England this past Saturday night. Michael Bisping retaining his title against the living legend Dan Henderson. And then, man, that co-main event. Did we ever see a performance a great from Gegard Mousasi yeah. and Vitor Belfort? Belfort's still dangerous. Mousasi saw it, but it just... He is, seems to be just on a different level. N- not with everybody. It seems that he has the potential to be on a different level in comparison mm. to everybody else. But when Musasi is in his zone, in his groove, and Vitor throws the punches, no, and then he goes right no, after. No, I don't think you want to hit me. He's so good. Why is this guy so good? Oh, man, it's just pure skill. It really is in his mind. Okay, I want you to Google something while I'm telling you yeah. the story. Google fight metric. Vitor Belfort, and you'll get right to his page. And the reason I'm asking you, so I saw this on Twitter. Unfortunately, I don't remember who tweeted this statistic first. Um, uh, it's just a statistic that exists on Fight Metric, but somebody identified this, this okay. uh, statistic. Vitor Belfort, in his entire UFC career, has never in a fight landed more than 20 significant strikes. Wow. And if you look, so you'll click on it, and you'll see his, and you'll go down. There are fights he landed six and eight. They just count. They just count. Um, and it's a different way of things. So just slide down it and look under significant strikes per fight, and uh, you'll see our Wi-Fi is, yeah, is, it's, it's not it is what it, yeah, is. it is. Yeah, so you'll see on under each fight as you look, yeah. there, you'll see significant strikes and yeah. read what they are uh, per fight. So in the last fight, eight, eight uh, four, yeah. six, yeah. 18, uh, 12, yeah, it's, it's never. Yes, he never. just he just takes guys yeah. out. He does, and that you know, people. There are certain words that we just hear a ton, and and language is a weird thing. Sometimes you just overuse it, or you rely on something, or things. You know, we used to start like I, I swear to God, Jimmy Smith was the first guy who used to say a high volume of punches. Right now, people just like, got to get more volume. Henderson said it. He's forty six. Yeah. yeah. You, 
that doesn't have to be the only word you use. It's not like that shows that you know a category. Anyways, I digress. Uh, but you know one word that people do use uh, when they're talking about a martial artist? Their economy. Yeah. They're, uh, they're economical in their uh, yeah, use of... A, Bruce Lee yeah, yeah. made that concept, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, I guess visible to people. So, yeah. and it makes sense. This guy. Yeah. Like, do you think of how many yeah. guys he's shut off with so few strikes? That's a whole different thing. I've over the last couple of years and seen different things and watched, I've come to, I've come full circle on my uh, Vitor. <laughs> now, maybe it was just when he was that jacked. Yeah. It was sort of such a <laughs> you to, to uh, everybody. But even you know? though, like, when you look at that Vitor, this is, you remember, this This is a young guy who really should be, it, when, when I saw Vitor on Saturday night and I saw his body, now yeah. granted he's 36 and he's needed everything yeah. he's needed to be yeah. able to look like that. Yeah. I actually think he probably should have been fighting at 170 pounds yeah. throughout his career. So you get all bulked up. As big as you possibly can, you're fighting at 180 or 190 yeah. pounds, going in fighting these 280 yeah. pound men in the yeah. UFC when you're a teenager. Well, so we, you you talked about Mike Perry off the top, who's yeah. going to be really fun to watch yeah. forever. You're right. Obviously, yeah. a guy like this, when he loses, will get not, will yeah, it yeah. stopped. Yeah, He's, you know, it's gonna that's, happen. but that's people love that. Yeah. That's a 155 pounder in a muscular yeah. jacked up. Yeah, 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 yeah. But he's knocked every single guy he's fought out. So you're going to go to him? Are we going to go to this guy and go, dude, you're fighting up a weight loss? So, no, I'm not. I've laid out every single yeah. one of these men. But those guys aren't Johnny take, Hendricks yeah. and Rory McDonald well, and George St. Pierre. But and- it's not what you're given. It's what you're taking. That is the issue. And that's the issue with Vitor, too. You're talking about these enormous guys. It's not that he couldn't knock him out. He totally could. But you're taking damage from these big, yeah, powerful yeah, yeah, creatures. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Mike Perry at 170, you know, hey, we don't have any reason to accuse anybody of using steroids. But you kind of look at this guy and you see his yeah. mannerisms and yeah. stuff. You're like, the smell test. Yeah. What, what they, yeah. Would you be shocked if someone <laughs> no. like you know, strutting through the world doing whatever the hell he wants kind of guy like that? You know, it now, if that is the case or he just got bigger without any of that stuff because he liked being big. That's cool. Sometimes you feel good when you have some muscle. But that guy's got muscle, too. And if you can get down to a lower weight class, you fight smaller guys. It's not, yes, you're smaller, but your skeleton and your brain and your skull and your neck take damage from smaller people. And I think that's the case. Vitor's still fighting well. You know, are we at the point, I mean, you look at those. Vitor threw six and eight punches and laid guys out. Can he still do that now with what his body's been through, with age, with the amount of abuse he's taken from heavyweights and, yeah. and light heavyweights? That starts to be the question. But he loves fighting still. It, and that's just who he is. And that's the thing. I think, and you know, I'm a big fan of you take some of these pioneers, these veterans, these superstars of the game, and you, like, does Vitor need to be fighting Derek Brunson? Does no. he need to be fighting these athletes? Of the, does he need to be fighting Musasi, or should he be fighting a 35-year-old Nate Marquardt yeah. at 185 yeah. pounds? That's a great fight. It's a great yeah. fight. Well, there's been uh, different guys, and it is the Vitors of the world, and even, you know, your, like, Henzos and people like that, they're like, hey, man, if there's a senior division, sign me up for some e- of these exactly. fights. Exactly. I mean, if they're going to bring in CM yeah. Punk, and they're going to bring in guys like Mickey Gall, why not have these older veterans take on somebody around their same experience, their same age level that's still competitive? And and again, hey, I'm not 100% convinced that Michael Bisping would beat Vitor Belfort again if they, if they fought again. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, Mike's getting up there, too. You know, he's getting up he's there, too. He's taking the, Exactly. They're both Man, around the same age. I, I just can't get, like, you know, hey, uh, we've there's something we talked about last week. and it, 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 You have the choice to have whatever reaction you want to have to anything. But I look at Michael Bisping and see a guy in his late 30s who's actualizing his actual mm-hmm. potential. Yeah. Like, wherever he was and whatever he's been doing, he is a... Uh, quality television guy, best fighter that he's ever been, a champion of the world, entertaining. I mean, you know, you look at um, uh, uh, a musician, you know, you look at an artist, you look at, at anyone doing anything, you're supposed to get better as you age. Athletes 
are supposed to as well. Look at what Henderson just did. But they also get these physical limitations mm -hmm. that they find. So they eventually, at 45, you're not as good of a fighter. And if you're fighting at 55, which I don't think many doctors would recommend, <laughs> uh, you, you're going to have physical limitations. But imagine if Dan Henderson's ability to throw this punch keeps getting better in his life. Yeah. Like he almost laid out that guy twice, and this guy's got a crazy chin. And uh, imagine if the ability, just the skill to throw that punch improves. He's going to get physically not quite as strong. He's going to, the, the, the fast twitch muscle, with all of those things will slowly atrophy, but the skill of doing it, you know, it's the golf swing of that punch can get better and better. I say let him take uh, testosterone and let's figure <laughs> out a way to get Dan Henderson back in there if he wants to. we got to take a break. Uh, we're looking ahead to New York as well as that fight night card going down in Mexico City. We Welcome back to Five Rounds Today. Ramdeen Black chatting about UFC 204. Of course, we're going to get to New York and the fight night card going down to Mexico City. We're just going to wrap up our thoughts. Uh, Michael Bisping defending against Dan Henderson. Musasi taking out Vitor Belfort. Uh, we talked about Mike Perry on the undercard. What were some of the bigger moments for you? We said Jimmy Manoa stopping Ooh, Ovin St. Yeah, Prue uh, yeah. in round two. Excellent body yeah. shots there. Yeah, that was the key to it. That was it. Kind of, if you can't breathe, you can't cover your, your head. And, and I felt the same like when I looked at the main event when I Bisping and Henderson, it felt that Dan Henderson was the most dangerous guy in there. Yes. Yes. That if anybody was you know, going to stop the other person, it was going to be Dan Henderson. The Bisping yeah. is just going to beat you down. Yeah. He's just going to play yeah. the game, yeah. smash up your body. Yeah. And you and I were talking about yeah. the strategy to damage Hendo's yeah. hand yeah. with yeah. kicks. The switch kicks, yeah. he did a lot. And that's what he did. Yeah. Uh, it, it just felt that the only way is if you break down his body over the course mm. of 25 minutes, mm -hmm. whereas Henderson, all he needs is one. Uh, we saw that. I didn't really felt that feel that way with Musasi, but I certainly felt that way with Jimmy Manoa and Ovin St. Prue. I felt that somebody in there was a dangerous fight athlete, and there was somebody else in there who was a big, strong, super athlete that learned the art of fighting. And when Jimmy Manoa found his groove, it felt like Ovin St. Prue was drowning. Yeah. Uh, a lot of that, I think, was just where their heads were at, too. Like, just imagine, you know, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, the, the, one of the more recent examples, there's one every week now, uh, like bringing somebody in and landing the, on them when they come forward. You know, Stephen Thompson has been doing that his whole career. Steve Bay did that to Verdum. We see it every Rumble. week. Rumble does that. O Ovin St. Prue has done it twice. He did it to Shogun, to Shogun and he did it to Cummins. Yeah, right. Shogun with the left hook backing up, Cummins with a, st a step and a right uppercut. That's very hard to do because you have to not be influenced by any amount of panic. You have to be like, you know, mm -hmm. we'll talk about it, we hear lots of people talk about it, sort of free to, to, to do your techniques. And you, you know, you, like <laughs> this doesn't, like that can accidentally work, but that's not, oh my God, like you, you but that's how most of us normal people would react. Um, and when OSP did that to both Shogun, Shogun was a little jumpier, but Cummins was a calmly yeah. exp calm expression of that. That's how you beat Jimmy Manoa, but it's very hard to stay calm. You know he like he can shut you off. You know he's got incredible skills. The pressure that he's creating isn't just physical; it's mental. Oh yeah. And you could feel OSP yeah. oh, wasn't. Yeah. He had no interest in setting and landing because of the risk involved in it. It wasn't a calculated risk versus reward analysis is just <laughs> holy shit he's coming at me like and that you're not gonna that's what rumble wants you to feel that's what um that's what uh, neck tattoos and garbrandt, what garbrandt yeah. wants you to feel vitor that's what vitor wants yeah, yeah, you to yeah. feel and that's what anthony wants you to feel and if you feel it it works better for them and, and how do you not feel it you must prepare for that and it's very hard to prepare for it um the, um, the, you can experience it in the gym. If you've got that guy in your gym who's just a 
terrible training partner. <laughs> he's too aggressive. He hurts guys. You have to train with him. You have to yeah, train right. with that guy. You, and you have to do it for a long time. So that must often. be important then. It is important. Even though it's yeah. like, okay, this I hate training with yeah. this guy because he yeah. goes too hard. Yeah. He hurts me and this yeah. and that. But don't you need that? You absolutely do. And you, as you become more experienced, if you understand you need it, you'll seek it out. You'll, you'll go and, and ask, coach, can I have some uh, rounds with him? Or we'll bring a guy in who's dangerous. Uh, um, Mullins and I talked to Coach Kavanaugh, and they brought in a guy for Connor, and it was really cool. Was, what's uh, Gangs of New York? Yeah, uh, yeah. What's, uh, who's that main actor with the knife? Uh, the... Butcher Bill. Yeah, what was uh, that actor? Daniel Day-Lewis. Daniel Day-Lewis. So apparently when he was doing that role, he stayed in costume the whole time. He never showered yeah, because yeah, yeah. in those days yeah, they didn't yeah. shower. And he'd stare at his co Like, if if you were supposed to be on the other gang, like he, <laughs> these method you know, actors, he's, he's man. eating and he's got his knife in his tooth. And he's playing, it's yeah, messing yeah. with you because that's... That's him, yeah. yeah. And they brought in a guy for Connor that did that. And he, they never talked. They never changed together. They never ate lunch together. They were enemies. They were enemies. Wow. That guy was in there for to be Nate Diaz. He was a bit of a talker. He had a, a, he was aggressive, always, and he was to create that always. That's that's cool. That's genius. That's genius. And so by the time, and if you sparred with him, let's say twice a week might be logical, uh, because you're gonna how many? You know, there's a lot of discussion. How much is too yeah, much? Yeah, how yeah. much is not enough? Let's just say it's twice. They may do three. Uh, let's uh, and for five weeks, that's ten times. You fight this guy ten times. You don't like him. You actually start to like him less as he's beaking you off every time he lands on you. Yeah, he yeah, says yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. You don't go after and hug him and thank him for the workout. Let's let's go grab sushi. He goes and he looks at you and he leaves the gym. That's brilliant. Uh, now after yeah. the fight, after the fight happens, do you go, do you revisit this guy? Say thank you uh, for getting me ready. I would say uh, almost certainly you would, unless we we have fight Nate Diaz again in the future. See you next time. <laughs> Just kind of leave him and let him go off and never. Well, you're not Facebook yeah. friends, you know. And that that helps. It, it, people might not think it does, but if we say any one of these small things, let's, let's say we've got ten or fifteen small little differences, and if any of them equal 0.5 of a percent of improvement, and there's ten of them, that's five yeah. percent better. So every little thing helps. And bringing in bringing in Anthony Robbins. Anthony Robbins, Anthony Rumble Johnson, Anthony Robbins. What do you mean? That, 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 He's got mentally, head. mentally, yeah. get you yeah, ready. Get him going. Uh, uh, Anthony Johnson to train for Jimmy Manoa, yeah. both are aggressive, and uh, but Anthony has a reputation of being a really good training partner, really gentle training partner. Maybe that's not true. I, I seem to have remembered that. We had to take a break. Yeah. We had to take a break. When we come back, we're, uh, we're going to discuss a whole bunch of things in the world of martial arts and then look ahead to the shows that are coming up in November. Welcome back to Five Rounds Today. We are going to move on from UFC 204 and talk about uh, the fight night card going down November 5th in Mexico City, the main event. And holy smokes, this is a good one. Um, former lightweight champion Rafael Dos Anjos, a guy that was people were calling one of the pound for pound mm -hmm. best because of his mm -hmm. performances uh, inside of the cage, taking on Tony Ferguson. Love this yeah. fight. Fantastic. So, if the last thing you saw with RDA was Eddie just mauling yeah, yeah, him, yeah. but you click on his name and, oh, yeah. and, and go back and his, the, the, how he was dismantling people. That hasn't gone away just because yeah, you got yeah. knocked out one time. That's, that's not like, oh, well, that's over. There's, what have you done for me lately, yeah. though? Like, but, this guy smoked yeah. Donald Cerrone. Yeah. 106 of round one, stopped Donald Cerrone, beat Anthony Pettis, beat Nate Diaz, knocked out Benson Henderson, knocked out Jason High. Oh, uh, man, oh, man. Then, only Khabib only in Khabib the last 12 fights. Beat Evan Dunham, yeah. beat Cerrone again, yeah. our boy Mark Bocek. This guy knows how to fight. This yeah. guy knows how to be a champion. Yeah. This guy knows how to hurt you what i'm interested to know is his evolution mm -hmm. because he started as a jiu-jitsu guy mm -hmm. and just like fabrizio verdum they're both you know the grappling art masters then they became stand-up masters mm -hmm. oh we we gotta want to sell fights we want to make ourselves as much money as humanly possible these north american fans don't seem so jazzed about yeah. this rolling around stuff. Yeah. Yeah. so we need to start knocking dudes yeah. out 
and that's what yeah. happened. Yeah, uh, it was Professor Cordero who built him and Verdum with yeah. this game, right? But I don't think he's with him now. He's been moving around a little bit, so I'm not 100% sure. But uh, he's still down there. I think he spends time, because he has that affiliation with Evolve yeah. in Singapore. Yeah, and I right. think he, Which he I spent... think he may teach while he's yeah, yeah, there, yeah. and you, you get paid and put up. And I, I hear you get paid pretty well over that's there. That's what I hear, too. Like, you know, come by for four months, and we'll give you $80,000, yeah, yeah, and yeah. you can train and yeah, have yeah. a place to live. Like, like pretty good. Um, but uh, so Professor Cordero is one of the real, real smart ones, right? And the best ones are making something work for where fighting is right now. And when he and Verdum were winning with this, uh, with this style, it was, we will murder you on the ground. So go ahead and try to take us down. We'd like that, uh, which means we can literally be just kickboxing you while you have to kickbox and defend takedowns. Mm -hmm. And just that, just that s simple difference between my assignments and your assignments was the key to their striking game. And it was just that. I'm I'm a boxer, kickboxer. You must defend all aspects of mixed martial arts. Then if you get to the point I can I will learn to identify when you have shift, oh shit, this is just a kickboxing match. Once you do that, I'll take you down. Because yeah. you're no longer paying attention yeah. to the yeah, assignments. Right. You're required to go to put a little more, you know, um, cognitive focus into your kickboxing game or I'm gonna beat you up. And when you do that, I pick up the signs that you're not not really engaged in the ability to defend a takedown. I take you down, I elbow your face. Yeah. That simple game uh, built around the one advantage that I had around being on the ground was how both he and Verdum built their whole game, so the hot lava concept. And now that's different. They can't do that anymore. The game has changed that, that inherent ability to stop the takedown with footwork or just an underhook or just my hip positioning has raised to such a level that you're kind of just kickboxing with that more automatic now. So this doesn't work anymore. So that when you say evolution, we have to see some. Yeah. We do. Because, and, and, and do you yep. expect to see some? Especially when we, and, and, and other, the only comparison here is that they're Brazilians. But we saw Jose Aldo, his whole career, yeah. being the pressure guy. Yes. Then 100%. Connor beat him, yep. and it's like, okay, I got to change this mm -hmm. up if I still want to yep. be at the top of the mountain. And he did. Yeah, he was a pole guy. He just pulled and, and countered against Frankie. And Mark Henry is another one of these absolute geniuses. I also, and we've met him and, and spoken to him and, and stuff. But what I like is when you, because this is a lesson for all of us in all walks of life. Something goes wrong. What did I do wrong? Yeah. Where, where is my that, responsibility? Yeah. And how can I address it? You know why that's good? It's because you'll get better. And Mark Henry took responsibility for not, because he was shocked. And he's human. And in that fight between Frankie and Jose. I thought he was going to come at us harder. They just, <laughs> nobody, nobody expected for, uh, Jose to fight that way. I was more shocked than they were. And I'd been watching nothing but tape on him. But it's because he had been that same thing where in this book, he said, never kick, never kick, <laughs> never kick, never kick. He never kicked, kicked, talk, Diego, kicked Sanchez. Diego Sanchez right in the head. He bluffed that shit for... 10 years, <laughs> and Jose was kind of the same thing. The more you watched him, the more that you had seen since the since he flying kneed my, my guy, Cub oh, Swanson, yeah. in, in the head, he barely took a step backwards for the next 10 years. To the point that you start to feel that that is forever Jose Aldo. Yeah. And once you start planning for that to be forever Jose Aldo, it's the perfect time yeah. for him to be something else. But, but did, would he have changed that if that was the, it's like, if the outcome of the Connor fight didn't occur, why would he need to change things? I, I agree 100%. And that's why, no matter how badly you can fixate on a failure or a situation that didn't go your way, it's undeniable that Jose Aldo, is a, who was one of the greats ever, is a better fighter and a better man and a better thinker and a be better strategist for having had that experience. Was it that fight that uh, changed your opinion about Jose? Yeah, the Frankie fight. I've yeah. always thought he was brilliant. but. I, I didn't understand the level of brilliance of him and and, Day -Day. and Professor Dede, yeah. That, to me, to be capable of being this thing, and that was also one of the things that really opened us up and our conversations up to this idea that if you're ever looking at a fighter, um, if, if you do our jobs or if you are uh, you know, analyzing somebody you're going to fight or your team is going to fight, as soon as you think what they are is what they are forever, you're, you're ready to be beaten. 
You ha- you really. How do you anticipate yeah. though? How do you anticipate their growth when there's so many factors yeah. involved? Mm-hmm. It's like okay, uh, I'm trying to prepare for something. All I've I've seen tape. This is what mm-hmm. that thing is. How do I prepare for something that he might not be? Yeah, I or know. She might I not know. be. I know it's crazy, right? But you, but you have to at least figure out what they were and what is possible, and expanding your understanding of how learning happens and what doorways can be opened will help. But in most people's case, uh, Dominic Cruz is fighting you. He's going to do all this. But he learned to do it on a higher level out of necessity when his leg was blown off. And he, for a job, he learned how to do it, and it made him better. He's going to do all this. He's going to anticipate where you're, what growth you're going to have. Um, and Connor is obsessed, as he often says. He'll do that. Um, but most fighters, they want to count on their coach to do that. You start thinking, because if I start analyzing you, I'm going to get very impressed with what I see. And I, I don't, we don't need my, our fighter mm-hmm. doing that. Dom won't, because nothing's going to impress him that you're going to do. You're right. And, uh, but Demetrius is going to go play video games. Matt's got this. And, it's, and when you talk to him, he's so, that trust is so powerful that, and you hear it in his voice, because you know he's right. Yeah. Matt do got this. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And that trust is so powerful. And so he, Dominic is Matt Hume and Demetrius in one guy. Mm-hmm. That is going to be draining, but he's going to continue to go through life, finding ways to optimize his own learning, lay out his day better, rest better, study better, compile information. So that's his path. And uh, but uh, Domin- uh, his partner on TV, uh, 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 Daniel Cormier, Daniel doesn't quite do it on that level because he trusts his coaches mm-hmm. to do it. And Dom trusts his coaches. Yeah, too, Eric Del Fiero is yeah, just, oh, yeah. you know, imagine now yeah. if you're Eric, what how much how thrilled you are that this guy understands things on yeah, such yeah. a high level. They're now going to push each other. It all it all works. All these best guys uh, at the top, their their uh, menu, their um, little uh, recipe is working, you know, because they're the top. So picks. RDA, does he change things? Does he play the more patient game? Does he allow Ferguson because Ferguson's super aggressive? Yeah, and Ferguson, you don't know what you're getting. If even if you study Ferguson, and I've been doing some of that, I'd like to to break this down, but I'm so focused on this Al- Alvarez Connor yeah, yeah, breakdown. Yeah. Um, but I love watching Tony fight, and w- when you analyze. Dominic, it'll take you a long time till you see it, but it isn't random. He knows what he's yeah. doing. It's it's purposeful. We're, and and I think that's true of Tony too, but it might not be. He yeah. literally might not know what he's doing next, and that's pretty I cool. I love that. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back. Uh, we're going to talk about the, the main event yeah. of that show in Mexico City, RDA and Tony Ferguson. We'll come back to five minutes. Welcome back to the show. We're looking at UFC Fight Night going down in Mexico City on November 5th. The main event, a lightweight tilt, five rounds. The former lightweight champion, RDA, Rafael Dos Anjos, taking on Tony Ferguson. And if you're RDA and his team, you know what Ferguson brings to the table. He brings genetics. Mm -hmm. He's going to be longer. He's durable. He's Mm -hmm. tough as nails. He's here to hurt you. And he has a different style of Mm -hmm. jiu-jitsu, not a traditional Mm -hmm. style Mm -hmm. like uh, like RDA. And I I know, if you're a jiu-jitsu guy... You learn all the, the fads, all mm-hmm. the all the barren bolos, and you learn this stuff. Henzo Gracie told me we learn it to be able to shut it down. Yeah, we're and not. So did uh, Loaf. Uh, so that's the, that's the goal. But I mean, the the tenth tenth planet mm-hmm. is designed for MMA. Yeah, yeah, it is. You yeah. know, so when that yeah. that's Eddie Bravo's philosophy, and kudos to Eddie Bravo for this the new tournament thing submissions uh, yeah. with open open yeah. palms Change everything. changes changes everything. everything. I love it. Yeah. So uh, when you're looking at this matchup. If you're the coaches of each guy, what is the philosophy? What is the game plan? Because you're, before the break, you're talking about Tony Ferguson. Is everything intentional? Does he do that, or does he have no idea, just goes out and tries to be creative and flowy? Yeah, it's hard to say. There are moments where you see, so like one of his big things, snap down city. Once he gets behind and you snap and you down, you're in trouble. And he'll believe that's true against RDA, and he very well could be right. Once he gets into that front headlock kind of a position, he has sequences and a spider web of sequences. And I think once he gets there, those are paths he's already built. He doesn't think about them, but thousands, oh, like that submission we saw uh, uh, Al- uh, Contra yeah. last week. 
um, a friend of mine turned to me and goes, wow, that is some high-level stuff. It kind of is, but blue belts do a lot of triangle to armbar to triangle armbar. Yeah, right. They just, al contra, just did that for 15 years. Yeah. But he was doing this 12 years ago. Lots of blue belts. Go to blue belt tournaments, you'll see guys working that. Now, so, you know... Uh, but that is l a lifetime of doing that. It's like, oh, well, this, oh, I feel, oh, so I'll switch to the armor. Oh, okay, yeah. no, I'll yeah, switch yeah. back to the triangle. You know, he's been doing that forever. Tony has those happening on little cues that, oh, you're flaring your elbow, cool, I'll squash yeah. this down and yeah. I'll go there. Yeah. So those, I think, are paths he's built. But, and the striking, he's using combinations and combinations with footwork in the middle of it that he's built. But a lot of it is improvisation. When he fought um, a groovy dude, Lando. Groovy Landro, uh, he just fought him. And uh, that was a risky thing to do. But, you know, this, and this goes right back to something you've talked about, you brought up many times, and it's a very interesting point that'll be a, a talking point forever. It will go to uh, RDA, and he may say, I have ga game plan A, B, C. I've come up with this. If this happens, we're going to do that. Yeah. And you'll go to another guy, and in this case, maybe Tony, and he'll go, I don't think about what he's going to do. I just get myself in a position to do what I do. Mm -hmm. And that question, what's and the, the way you've, you've often posed it is, well, what's the right answer? And I've thought about it, and w I think the right answer is different for every scenario. Mm -hmm. And the biggest, if you could do both, if you're capable of doing both, that's great because you can apply that thinking to the scenario because when you fought Diaz the first time, you, you went in and we're just gonna fight. And when they fought Diaz the second time, they built specific yeah, right. game plans around him because they had to. Uh, so I think being able to do both is the key, but it's tough to say. I'd really, we've talked to Tony and we were there for his, his I think he got two Barbosa. bonuses. Yeah. Two bonuses no, that Just a night. great night. Yeah. And that's one of the things I love about watching Ferguson is he's battle tested. He can take mm. it and he's never out of the fight. And, and did he underestimate Groovy Lando? Mm. Uh, I think he underestimated the risk of that type of fighting uh, against a guy like that because now we're just throwing dice on the table and seeing what numbers come up because he's like that too. This guy had, but it's also the situation. Um, we had a week and I don't know anything about you and you don't know anything about me. So it's definitely of the highest importance that I just go out and, and have my freest performance and Tony's best like that. But And I would imagine though part of the strategy when it comes to that, it's like, yeah, I've been here countless times. He's never That's been right. here in the That's UFC. True. That's so true. he's just going to fold because I yeah. I know what it's yeah. like. Yeah. It's you know, very yeah. different than the regional yeah. show. So he's just going to melt. And that's kind of what yeah. happened. So by the end, physically, he, uh, he had taught him to hesitate by by engaging him in, in his thing. And then he got and he also got physically tired. I think he might have been up a weight class. Was he? I don't know. Maybe maybe not. No, it was 55. Yeah, it was yeah. 55. Uh, but, uh, you know, short notice, you're going in against Tony Ferguson at a super high-paced, you know, five minutes and then seven minutes and then nine minutes at some point, and he taught him to hesitate, and Tony's unbreakable. Although Matt, uh, Matt uh, Brown told us there's no such thing, yeah, and right. nobody's mentally strong. It, it is a result of hard work. And when you hear Matt Brown say that, that becomes 100% true for yeah. him. There's no debate. Because that means yeah. he's like, actually, yeah. I'm mentally fragile. Uh, I just take a good beating. Yeah. Or uh, or wait, I think uh, what, what he was pointing us towards was, yes, when you saw me fight this night and this night and this night, I was mentally tough. And if I just go into the next one, assuming I'll automatically be that way, I'll fold eventually. Mm -hmm. Because the, I am not just by nature mentally tough, I work on it and I study and mm -hmm. I push myself and I learn things about myself on the path to the fight that reinforce to me that mental toughness. Super cool. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna move on. We're gonna take a break. When we come back, it is the biggest show, certainly of the year, maybe the biggest show ever in mixed martial arts history, the lightweight championship of the world <laughs> online. And in addition to that, two other title fights. We're discussing that when we come back to five rounds. Welcome back to Five Rounds today. Coming up November 12th is the card of the year. UFC 205 in Madison Square Garden in New York City. The main event, Conor McGregor, Eddie Alvarez. Have you had a chance to let that marinate? Oh. Have you been thinking about, okay, when I'm, I'm objective, envision 
The cage door closes. These guys touching gloves or not touching gloves. What are you going to see? <sighs> yeah. It's a great, it really is a great fight. There's so many things going on in there. Um, the way I'm building the breakdown, as you know, for two or three years ago, I made, created something called the Sap Alvarez Scale that charts your propensity for risk taking versus risk aversion with your ability and willingness to tolerate damage, suffering, et cetera. And I'm looking at how Eddie has gone from the highest ranking of that to the championship level in because the Because if, if, I'm, if I'm correct, you said that in that scale, the champion's around a certain yeah, thing. Right. And Eddie's, because of his intelligence, he's like, I, okay, I, I don't, as much as I want to be an action fighter, I want to keep this belt yeah. for a long time, yeah. and I got to get closer yeah. to the GSPs and the Anderson Silvas exactly. at the time. And he told me he did that uh, purposefully for that reason, for his health and to win um and then i want to look at where connor started sitting on there because connor it was a crazy risk taker <laughs> in a lot of situations you look at a and he took a lot of punches because he understood to land his power he had to take your power and he was quite confident he could do that and the jose aldo thing is sort of that his thought process in a microcosm yeah, right. in, a, in the 13 seconds um so because mendez landed they all did and he knew it and he understood that was the risk he had to take so he took damage and took a lot of risks um then that's when, why i love him yeah everybody yeah. will everybody will appreciate that kind of fight and if you don't like him for whatever reason, that kind of fight will incite that even more. Yeah. Um, but then against, he was a big risk taker, but he had the willingness, but not the ability to suffer because of the way that Diaz fought him. Mm -hmm. And so he brought it down. It was about it was about strategy. It was far less risk take risk oriented in that second fight. So I want to examine him and how he's changed in that. So I've been looking at that more than how they match up. Uh, but, and it's it's really tough to say. McGregor believes he can knock him out with that left hand. Eddie's there to be hit somewhat. I don't think Eddie is taking the risk, the, the, the threat, Mc, what Br Mc, McGregor brings as seriously, he, at least he's saying he's not yeah, taking right. it that seriously. He, is. he probably is, yeah. yeah um, he can wrestle like crazy. He can box like crazy. He needs to get through the fire to get a hold of him or land on him, and that fire is hot, man. Over the next number of weeks, we're going to be delving right into this UFC 205 card, which is the first card to ever go down in New York City. That is another show in the books. On behalf of Robin Black, our producer Chase Kaiser, I'm John Ramdean. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you guys next week.